Good evening. Our scripture reading this evening is going to be taken from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 23. Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 23. We'll begin reading in verse 1. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. Matthew chapter 23, beginning in verse 1. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds. For they say things, and they do not do them. And they tie up heavy loads, and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. But they do all their deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries, and they lengthen the tassels of their garments, and they love the place of honor at the banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and the respectful greetings in the marketplace and being called by men, Rabbi. But do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called master, for one is your master, that is, in Christ. But the greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted." What we want to talk about this evening is the reason why certain spiritual titles are forbidden by Christ and why he would make these distinctions and what does it mean whenever we call a human, a man, by the title of rabbi or father or master. Jesus forbade his disciples to even elevate themselves above one another, and we understand that his disciples took that to heart, and we can find examples of that. Is my little clicker down there, Ethan, right next to you? I bet it is. I don't want to hear it, Roger. I know. (laughs) <laughs> just earlier I was trying to find my zip drive for the lesson for the PowerPoint and he goes, does this happen to you often, Jed? And so I, I was reluctant about even going down there and getting it because I saw Roger in my peripheral right there. Turn with me to Acts chapter 10 and look at verse 25 with me. Verse 25 and 26 we're going to look at uh, specifically. But remember... Peter goes to Cornelius' house. An angel of the Lord has come to Cornelius and has said, go down to Joppa, get Peter. And Peter has come up to Caesarea and he has found there those that are seeking the gospel. This man, Cornelius, is so glad to see uh, Peter that it says in verse 25, when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and he fell at his feet and he worshiped him. Now, Cornelius didn't know any better. All he knew was that this man was bringing the message of salvation and he mistakenly attributed to him supremacy over himself and he fell down at his feet. But listen to what Peter's response is to him. And I can't help but think that within the ears of Peter rang Jesus' voice of do not call any man rabbi. Peter helped him up saying, stand up, I too am just a man. Why is that so clearly written for us? What is the purpose behind that? Peter says, listen, Cornelius, I am just a man like you. Now, certainly Peter was bringing that message that he wanted to receive, but that message was an elevation, not of Peter, but it was an elevation of Christ. Even angels were careful to tell men not to bow down and to worship them. Whenever John was receiving the visions and the revelations of the words of Christ from an angel in Revelation chapter 19 is the specific incident that I want us to look at, but it happens three times within the book of Revelation that at once receiving that 
uh, vision that John falls down and he wants to worship at the feet of the angel. And look at verse 9 of Revelation chapter 19. And then he said to me, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. And then I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Not even an angel would allow for a man to worship. And a similar instance happens to Paul and Silas whenever they are in Lystra in Acts chapter 14 and verse 14. They had just healed a man within the community and those people within Lystra perceived them to be gods, to be Zeus and to be Hermes. And so they began to worship them and what was Paul's response to them? He tore his garments. He says, don't do this. We are men in like nature such as yourself. You would think if anyone deserved to be worshipped upon this earth besides Christ himself that it would be an angel or that it would be an apostle. But in all three of these instances that we looked at, and there are many others within the scriptures that we could point out, it is strictly forbidden. Why? Because to elevate man to a position of supremacy above other men is to put them between God and human. Okay? And so we're going to go back. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 23 this evening and this teaching of, of Jesus to his apostles, to his disciples that they took heart in and to try to understand why it is that man is not to be given the title of supremacy above others. Beginning in verse 8, Matthew chapter 23, but as for you, do not be called rabbi for only one is your teacher and you are all brothers and sisters. And do not call anyone on earth your father, for only one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called leaders, for only one is your leader, and that is Christ. Three titles. Here it's called leaders, but it's rabbi, it's father, and master in other translation. In the Greek, that term for rabbi means this, so that if you were to refer to somebody with this particular title, what you would be saying to them is my great one or my honorable sir. You would, in effect, be calling that person, if you were to call them rabbi, you would be calling to them your master, my great one. Now, we know that that refers to the upbringing of the Jews, that they uh, still use that term within their circles of rabbi or teacher. But what it actually means within the context of the way that Jesus is using it is saying, you are calling for a man, for a human being, to become your master, to be become your teacher. And what was Jesus's response to that? He says, you shall not do that. In John chapter 13 and verse 13, as Jesus was talking to his disciples about his position with them, notice how he terms it. John chapter 13, he has just finished washing his disciples' feet. And he says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. And then he goes on to say, if I, your teacher and Lord, wash your feet, then you should wash one another's feet. But what he is saying to them is, I am correct in holding this place of supremacy over you. You are my disciples. After all, what do we call ourselves? Christians, right? We don't call ourselves Hamblinites or Sykesites, right? You say, oh, that is just wrong. I, I wouldn't follow after any other man. And Jesus is making that clear. You have one teacher. And by implication from what he says in John chapter 13 is I am he to call somebody else rabbi, to call somebody else, my master, to call somebody else, my teacher puts them in that place of supremacy that only belongs to God. You shall not elevate God says any man into that position. And then he says, you shall call no man father on earth. Now within the context, we know that 
Jesus is not saying that you can't call your physical dads by that title. That, that's not what he is saying. What he is saying, in the spiritual context, you don't call any man father. Why? Well, because within the Greek, father was the originator or the transmitter of everything. He was the author of the family or of the society. And in a spiritual sense, he was the one who infused his spirit into others so that he actuated and governed their mind. Who is it that deserves to have such a position within our life? I know it sounds pretty similar to what we are talking about with rabbi or with master, but that is a title that Christ says we are not to place upon anyone else. Why? Because spiritually speaking, there is no man that is my father in the sense that it is his spirit that is infused within me that actuates and it governs my mind. Whenever man has usurped Christ and assuming such a position, what do we find happening amongst their followers? David Koresh? Huh? Jim Jones? What takes place whenever man assumes a position of spiritual guide and of authority that doesn't belong to him? Disaster. Now, there are many other cases in which that is used uh, within the world and not disastrously because physical death doesn't come upon those followers, but yet spiritual death, nonetheless, is still the result of placing anybody in that position of supremacy above myself and between God. Call no man father, for you have one father. And so what is Jesus saying? Man cannot assume my position as leader. Man cannot assume my position as the father in, in, in heaven as one who infuses his spirit and actuates and governs the mind. And he says, neither call any man master. And the Greek word there means a guide or a teacher. And it seems to simply be a re-emphasis of this same concept. You are to call no man master. You are to call no man teacher. And so as we look at this and we look at the attitudes of the disciples that they walk away with, having been with Jesus for the time that they have, understanding their place within the kingdom of God, it is clear that those apostles understood no matter how we teach, and with teaching comes great responsibility, James chapter 3, no matter who we are by way of of revelation or of miracles because the apostles were endowed with those types of things. He's, they are but fellow brethren with those other Christ, with those other Christians in Christ. Look at what Jesus says within the initial part of what we read in chapter 23. He says, you are all brothers and sisters. That's the reason that you are to call no man rabbi because only one is your rabbi. Within the Old Testament, we see a narrowing of access to God, okay? Out of all the nations within the world, God had made a promise to Abraham and to his seed. And from Abraham's seed, specifically that family of Israel is designated. Out of all the nations within the world, Israel's uh, nation is designated as to hold to the promise. Out of all of Israel, it's one tribe. It's the tribe of Levi that is able to administer and to work as the priesthood. Out of all the priesthood, out of all that tribe, there's one family that is going to administer the worship of, and that is Aaron's family. And then specifically, specifically Aaron himself being the one who was able to be the high priest and enter into. That is now inverted, don't you see it, within the New Testament to where we all have access to God through Christ, that we are all a priesthood within him, that we don't have to wait upon somebody else in order to have access to God. We have that through Christ and through his teachings. Now, let me, let me just put a disclaimer here. This does not mean that there is not a place for for preaching and for evangelizing. That doesn't mean that there is not a place for our elderships and for us to honor those men who are placed within those positions, that there's not a place for that leadership within the church. But what do we have to understand? Well, even Peter, who was an apostle but also a shepherd within the church, look at the way that he says it in 1 Peter chapter 5. Listen to how even though within the mind's eye of man, he could have been seen as having the position and being one who is elevated 
and people still do that to Peter today, don't they? Listen to what he says to, about himself, beginning in verse 1, 1 Peter chapter 5. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntary, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And whenever the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. What is Peter recognizing? Even though he has the position, even though he seemingly has the power, even though he has the authority, what is he? He says, I am a fellow elder. He doesn't even call upon himself to be elevated. And in fact, he says, and don't you do it either. Even if you're an elder within the church, even if you are one of those men who has been designated to lead, Peter says, you do it by way of example, not domineering over the flock, but as an example to them. The apostles recognized that just as you and I are going to stand before the judgment seat of God someday, so they too also. And so it's recorded for us in Romans chapter 14 and verse 10. But as for you, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or you as well, why do you regard your brother or your sister with contempt? For we will all appear before the judgment seat of God. Now there are some who assume spiritual authority who will think that they have special exemptions on the day of judgment. There are those because of their place that they have on this earth and the position and the power that they have, they believe that God is going to give some sort of special exemption to them on the day of judgment that they won't have to be held ac accountable like the common man because they have been given so much. Is that what Peter says? Or is that what Paul says here? He says, I don't even presume to judge my own brother because my brother and I both are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It is man's relationship with God, with Christ, that is most important, not with his rabbi or with his master or with his teacher. It's that relationship of a common salvation that brings us into the family of God. No exemptions. No exemptions. Even though the apostle did have special insights that he was endowed with, all of them with the pouring out of the Holy Spirit initially upon them, even they did not presume a place of authority. Even while performing miracles, even while preaching the gospel, if any man was to bow down to them, what were they going to say immediately to that? Don't do that. That is not who we are. To have a human being stand in the place of authority and to receive homage and honor and worship that belongs alone to Jesus Christ, our teacher, our master, our guide, in the place of our heavenly father is to go directly against those things that he has taught. Why? Because it puts man in a position of guide, separate and apart from God. We are all priest. We are all followers of God, but that is exactly what we are. We are followers. We are not to assume. We are not to take hold of and say, this is my lot. We are not to receive, even if given to us, any such title that would represent spiritual father, guide, master, or rabbi. Paul says of himself, whenever he was dealing with the church at Corinth, if you remember, they were trying to divide over different individuals within the church. Some say I was of uh, Apollo. Some would say that I am even of Paul. And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed. Even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. There are times uh, whenever mom got dinner, finished and the first child that was closest and it could have been as young as four years old might have been the eight-year-old right there but they were commissioned by mom to do what 
you go and you get the rest of the family. You let them know that dinner is ready. And so out they would go with a little bit of, of steam behind them, right? Because mama said, and they were able to say, hey, it's time for dinner. And what did the rest of the family have to do? They had that little bit of authority. And they, they had to stop whatever they were doing, whatever playing that they were going on, and they would have to come. And if they didn't come, then you could add that, well, mama said, right? And boy, then, then they would come. And what is Paul saying here to the Corinthians? He is saying, you were called, but it wasn't by my authority. It was by Christ. We were commissioned by Jesus to present the gospel to you. You can't elevate us. It's not our authority. It's not our wisdom. It's not our intelligence. It's of Jesus Christ. What is Apollos? What is Paul? Paul Paul says not as, or Peter says not as domineering. Peter and Paul say don't fall at our feet. Apollos, filled with the Holy Spirit, performing miracles, those apostles were. But don't fall at our feet. Because within their minds, they had teachings of Christ ringing in, in their ear of call no man father. Call no man rabbi. Call no man master. For you have one teacher, one guide, one father. And where are they? They are. He is in heaven. You are all children. Now, that doesn't mean, and let me say this again, please, that there aren't positions of leadership within the church, that we do not designate certain individuals to evangelize and to preach the gospel and others to be elders or bishops or shepherds within the congregation. But nonetheless, those are never to rule or to assume that position other than that which is given to them by God to do, and certainly not to be given a spiritual title that they do not deserve. Whenever it comes to spiritual titles that are used today, what are some of the other ones that you hear that are out there that maybe we haven't thus far uh, taken a look at? Have you ever heard reverend? You ever heard somebody be called by the name reverend? Is that a biblical term to call somebody else reverend turn with me to the book of psalm in psalm 111 and the one time that the name reverend is is used it is within the book of psalm 111 and verse 9 now i'm going to read it within the new american standard version first and it's not going to quite come out but then within the king james you'll see it there okay uh, he has sent redemption to his people he has ordained his covenant forever Holy and awesome is his name. Who is that speaking of? Who is that talking about? Who is the author of redemption? Who is the source of the covenant? Well, it's talking about Christ, isn't it? It's talking about God. It, within the New Test or the King James Version, excuse me, it says, He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. Who deserves the title of reverend? Who is the author of the Great Commission? No one but Jesus. No one but God. Would that not fall into the category if you were to call somebody reverend as call no man rabbi, call no man father, call no man master? To stand in awe is what it means to revere someone or their name is reverend. To fear, to reverence, to honor, to respect and man does not deserve to have such an accolade. Only Jesus and only God, only the Holy Spirit in the way in which he has revealed himself to us within the scriptures and is working within our lives. Now, you may think that this is just as an aside, but let me just mention the title that is not appropriate in order to be used. And, and I think everybody here might uh, be well aware of the fact that I am an evangelist. <laughs> I am not a pastor. And I have people come up to me even at my young age and they will, say, they will call me pastor. And that word pastor is only used one time within the scriptures and it's in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. And it's here on the screen. He gave some to be, some as apostles, some as prophets, and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the working of service to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Now, that term, pastor, is a shepherd's term, 
And it means a caretaker of the flock. And it was used in reference to the elders or the leaders within the church. And there was always a plurality of them. And in fact, one more passage, we could delve uh, much more into this, but we have just recently with Sunday uh, morning and looking at leadership within the church. But if you look at Titus, Paul in talking to Titus about the work that he is to do, says to him in chapter 1 and verse 5, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as directed as I directed you. Paul says to Titus, you go and you correct those things that are lacking within the church. And what was lacking within those churches is that they didn't have elders, a plurality, so that if a man became an elder that he would always have other men serving with him. God has always designed that leadership within the church be balanced. We talk about checks and balances. Whenever you have more than one elder, then you don't have one man elevating himself to the point and without being called into account by the other ones. We even have, uh, by the Hebrew writer, him commissioning the congregation that if an elder is within the wrong, that they are to treat them as a brother, but they are to call them out on that. And that means to go to them individually first, and then if that doesn't help, then to take a witness, and then if that doesn't help, then they are to bring it before the church. But I'm just saying that even as elders, they are held accountable so that a man within the congregation as an elder, he might be called a pastor, but he would not be called the pastor, right? Do you understand it? There would be a plurality of men within the church. Uh, My father has served as an elder within the church. It would be proper for anybody that was to call him uh, a, a pastor, but that's not what the world designates whenever they use that title today. You talk about what the denominational world has done to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, and the man that is the pastor is basically the head of the church. He's not only the man that stands in the pulpit. He is the one that is, in a secular sense, guiding and teaching he is the master not only do they not teach what is truth they assume a power that is not theirs to assume the way that term that is used today and like I said it's it's taken out of context but it's basically as a pastor is one who is assuming a position of power of guide and of teacher and of father and of master and quite often when a man gets into that position and a congregation follows he assumes too much and his leadership has overstepped there should always be within the congregation if there is going to be a pastor then there should always be a plurality of shepherds right because a a, a shepherd is another term that we use that's biblical as long as there is a plurality the exception to the rule is where a preacher can also be a pastor Right? And we have that exception to the rule within our congregation here. My dad served in that capacity, both in the congregation that he is serving right now, both as minister and also as an elder within the church, also in Wellington. And we, we are thankful for those men who are serving in, within that capacity. But you've got to admit, that can get kind of dicey, right? I mean, if you have... A minister who is also a pastor who then begins to assume just a little bit more power and and take a hold of the reins. But in that particular case, okay, an individual who is a preacher could be called a pastor. Uh, But they would make sure, as my dad always did, that they don't like that term to be used because it, it designates a title. They would rather make it clear that I am just one of the elders who also preaches and has been commissioned to lead the church in in such a way as well. Clear? (laughs) I believe that Jesus makes these points for a reason. Any time that man assumes a position of authority that belongs to Jesus and belongs to God, not only puts his soul in danger, he puts the soul of the congregation in danger as well. Whenever the apostle Paul said of himself, what is Apollos, what is Paul, 
What he was saying is Jesus Christ is Lord. He was saying that Jesus Christ is master. Do not hold up any type of man within this position of spiritual supremacy, for we are all brethren. I really think it's interesting that not even an angel in the book of Revelation, three times as John falls before him and desires to worship him, he says, no, I am but a fellow servant with you. That's why Paul says, if I or an angel from heaven preach unto you any other gospel, than that which has been preached unto you, let him be accursed. Even if an angel begins to teach you something other than what I have teach you, he is assuming an authority that is not his own. If I or an angel preach unto you any other gospel than that which I have preached unto you, he says it twice for emphasis, let him be accursed. And do you know why that is? And why it's so important to remember is because we can only have our forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. It is only Christ and his blood that stands between me and my sinful self and God, right? To do anything else is to put somebody else within that position. So if any man begins to assume that position between me and Christ, he is assuming that he is my savior. That's really what he is doing. He is assuming that he has the right of access and that only through him can one be made righteous. And Paul says, not even me. I don't even stand up in that position. Rise up. Stand beside me. You are but fellow servants with me. We are likened unto you. And Jesus says, don't you dare attempt to put a man between you and I. Call no man rabbi. Call no man father. Call no man teacher. To do so is to give sovereignty to a human. Okay, so in the process of religious titles and acclaim, let's be very careful in doing things the way that the Bible has described them and calling them by Bible names and making sure that it is the words of Jesus who that we follow and that is his spirit that actuates and governs our mind. Have you given yourself to him? He calls for you to become his child, for you to become his student, for him to be your master, to be your rabbi, to be your father. But that takes you repenting of the lifestyle in which you are living and saying, I desire to live a life now with Christ, confessing him as Lord and Savior, being baptized, putting on his his name and becoming a part of his, his people, and then never, ever allowing man into that position of your authority. Won't you come as we stand and as we sing?